Welcome to Gluten, Glyphosate, and the Industrialization of Our Food System. The purpose of this webinar is to explore the steady rise of gluten sensitivity over the last few decades, and to dig a little deeper into our current food system and the impact that it, it's had on, our, on human health. I'm Dr. Cindy Fallon, VP of Science and Innovation at the Seraphic Group, and I'm thrilled to be moderating this exploration of a topic that can be controversial, somewhat controversial and definitely complex, and a topic about which many people, including myself, have lots of questions. Just um, by way of quick background, I'm an organic chemist, uh, and I was the global technology manager of uh, specialty chemicals clean and disinfect businesses for a large chemical company where I was employed for almost 27 years. Toward the end of my time there, my health began to fall, fail quite dramatically. And in my pursuit to regain health, uh, I became aware of the microbiome and its importance and the role that I played in um, my own health demise by what I was consuming. This led me to seek out all natural solutions to some of our most far reaching health problems, which ultimately is what led me to the Seraphic Group. So enough about me, for our panel, we're bringing together experts in human health, science and advocacy, including Dr. Zach Bush. Zach is ION's CEO and founder. He is a physician, an internationally recognized educator and thought leader on the microbiome as it relates to health, disease and food systems. We have Dr. John Gilday. John is chief science advisor for ION and one of the founders. John has helped spearhead a lot of ION's foundational and ongoing science and has expertise in genomics, kidney cell function and toxicity, hypertension and metastatic cancer. We have Jeffrey Smith. Jeffrey is an international best-selling author, award-winning filmmaker, and the leading spokesperson on the health dangers of genetically modified organisms or GMOs. His book, Seeds of Deception, ignited a movement by exposing industry and government lies about GMO safety. And finally, we have Kelly Ryerson. Kelly is also known as Glyphosate Girl. And Kelly is an environmental health writer, an ardent public health advocate, and mother working at the intersection of pesticides, nutrition, and chronic disease. So we are so happy to have each of you here as panelists. I'm very grateful for your time. So I um, hope everybody has their coffee, their water, their tea, and we're gonna go ahead and dive right in. Let's start with a the, with the very general discussion around gluten. Is gluten inherently harmful? Um, something like 25% of Americans are now avoiding gluten with or without a diagnosis. So with a quarter of our population completely avoiding bread and grain products, is there justification for cutting out wheat or is there more to the story? Is there more nuance here? So um, Kelly, let's start with you. I know you're following a strict gluten-free diet. What has your experience as a consumer and, and as someone who suffers with gluten sensitivity, was it hard making a switch to that kind of diet? Have you found a successful path? Um, and it does it continue to be difficult to, to navigate? Yeah, well, thank you so much for having me, um, Cindy. I would love to talk about this. So um, my path to understanding my gluten sensitivity was really tricky. In my case, my health was really rapidly deteriorating and I really didn't know why. And I had such a wide variety of symptoms like across different body systems that it was really hard to pinpoint what exactly could be the root cause. And so I had a whole, a bevy of doctors. So I had a neurologist for my neuropathy. I had an ophthalmologist because my eyes were like blurry and I had floaters. And, and then I had a dermatologist because I would get these huge rashes. And I had a Lyme specialist because one time in college I was bitten by something and I thought, well, maybe that's what it is. Maybe it's the Lyme. And unfortunately, despite being very well-meaning, none of these doctors could really come up with a resolution outside of giving me medication to sort of help my symptoms, um, to help my symptoms. But there were also some doctors that told me that the symptoms were just in my head because they couldn't make sense of how my whole system could be upset like that. And then finally, a new doctor told me, why don't you try going gluten-free? And like, 
honestly, I thought that that was maybe minimizing my, my symptoms because I just seen these really top level physicians and it, and I thought if it could just be something simple, like giving up gluten, they certainly would know about that. And moreover, I just heard about this gluten-free trend from like LA, the LA like celebrity scene. I literally had just heard JLo talking something about gluten-free. And so I thought, well, I'm in a pretty bad state. I'm going to go ahead and try it. And so I did, and I was amazed. I started eating gluten-free and organically, and my symptoms just really started to lift. And it was just so thrilling and really miraculous at the time when it was happening. And it's so interesting with this non-celiac gluten sensitivity because um, a lot of times the symptoms are not digestive where you might expect them. In fact, there was a recent Italian study and it found that 53% of the people that were suffering from non-celiac gluten sensitivity actually had symptoms that were not digestive. So there was, was fatigue and fibromyalgia and migraines and anxiety and foggy brain and a lot of symptoms, but not specifically digestive systems. So when I, and now that I am gluten-free, I tend to treat it just as if I had celiac disease, which is an autoimmune condition specifically where you cannot have gluten. But I too can't eat gluten in a very similar way because if I do, if I'm even cross-contaminated, then I will first get like a really disgusting red rash on my cheek, like right there. And then I will um, need to go to sleep for like 24 hours. And by the time I wake up, I am just really exhausted still and really mad <laughs> because I don't want to have to deal with this. And, and from the beginning of discovering my sensitivity, I have just really wanted to know why, like what on earth is happening to our grain that this is even a problem. Like for so many of us, particularly people that would be joining here um, for this meeting, it, it's just like we're unwilling to accept this as being a new normal because there's nothing normal about a sudden mass intolerance to a grain that's been used as just a key source of nutrition for millennia. And wheat and barley have nourished humanity like since antiquity. Like the cultivation of wheat was birthed in this cradle of civilization and it allowed for urban centers to be to be um, constructed. And, and so it just doesn't seem compatible that humanity is starting to not be able to tolerate wheat and grain. And so it, in this this problem with tolerating gluten is enormous. So right now the market for gluten-free foods is $8.9 billion and it's expected to grow um, 10%. So by 2027, um, it'll be worth more than $17 billion. And it's interesting because in these, these market analyses, the stock analysts will say, well, it's because people that live in North America are so you know health conscious that the North American market is really growing and it's dominating the industry. But I would argue that the growth is actually due to the fact that in North Carolina, North Carolina in North America, we are just absolutely plagued with chronic disease and desperately looking for resolutions because of our um, agriculture system and the industrialized agriculture system and the ever increasing use of the weed killer glyphosate. Uh, being sprayed and used as a pre-harvest aid, um, a desiccant, to facilitate an easier harvest. And meanwhile, we're all exposed then as we're eating the grains to the glyphosate. So um, it's it's interesting because so many people will think that this that eating gluten free is is a good health trend, but gluten free foods really are not necessarily healthier. A lot of times they're nutrient dense, um, or they're not nutrient dense. They're they are like caloric, they're calorie rich, but they are uh, nutrient poor. And they'll, uh, like in the case of rice, sometimes you're more exposed to arsenic. Um, organic gluten-free choices are really hard to find if you are looking for a quick bite of some kind of packaged good. And most of the packaged brands and the almond flours and the rice flours, they're really very rarely organic. And What's especially upsetting about that is that people that are bothering to go gluten-free obviously have some health conditions already that they're trying to address. And so they're looking for these other alternatives to be healthy, but then the, the gluten-free options are more chemically laden because you can't get 
the organic versions very often. So it's it's like a double insult. And another component to uh, being gluten-free that is a bummer is that a lot of times the packaged goods, once again, like not for everyday use, but if you're looking for a quick bite, they are oftentimes much more expensive than the gluten containing foods. So it really is a financial disadvantage on top of your other health issues to have to eat in a gluten-free way. So we really need to find a solution to this gluten problem before the entire American population uh, is forced to change their diet to gluten-free just for having a normal functioning body. That, that's, um, uh, it sounds infuriating and it sounds exhausting, um, but you've been able to make that an empowering situation where you've taken action. Um, so, you know, thank you on behalf of all of the, of us learning for taking that action. So thank you, Kelly, that was really helpful. Sure. Dr. Gilday, John, can you speak a little more to the science of gluten impact at that gut lining and how glyphosate comes into the picture? Because I think we've heard, you know, one argument, it's not gluten, it's glyphosate, or perhaps it is gluten, but glyphosate makes it worse. Um, so it's not clear, it is confusing. Can you help just educate us about that kind of at that scientific level, the molecular level at the gut? Yeah, so I would, <clears throat> I would say that um, probably a good place to start for understanding is that um, the peptide that's in gluten, uh, all intestinal cells are sensitive to it. So I think that's a good place to start is that, is that when you, what happens when you eat a gluten rich meal? So it gets into your stomach. Um, gluten is a uh, polypeptide or a protein that tends to, to be sticky. So it makes uh, polymers. And so it, it's the part of bread that makes it soft and gooey and, and tasty. And uh, so the amount of gluten that's in wheat has been, you know, selectively um, bred to be higher and higher and higher. And then the, the next step in, in this is that when it gets to your stomach, it's digested first by um, in your stomach by pepsin and then trypsin. And so there's those that one peptide is turned into a number of peptides. And there's actually um, four peptides or five, depending who you talk to, that are harmful in gluten if they're not digested the whole way down to the amino acid level. So I think that's the, the good place to start. So um, when it goes to the stomach, um, I simulate that by taking a purified um, alpha gliadin, the, the peptide, and digesting it in the lab with, with pepsin and then trypsin. And you end up with these uh, active um, peptides that you can put onto a model system of intestines. And what we find when we do that is that the intestinal layer is disrupted. And so uh, in the last, I would say 10 or so years, the mechanism for how that works has been nearly completely worked out. And that, um, so the, the peptide, there's there's a zonulin inducing peptides, there's two of them. And so zonulin is the natural hormone um, molecule, hormone-like molecule that allows for immune system to invade into the interior of the uh, intestine if you have an infection. And so that zonulin being released is, is a process where this uh, zonulin inducing peptides that come from gluten bind to a receptor CXCR3, and it turns on a cascade of, of uh, signaling molecules that end up disrupting the gut um, uh, tight junction. And so that's sort of the beginning of, of a lot of the issues that are going on. Um, uh, and Dr. Fasano, who's the head of gastroenterology at Harvard, has led this charge of understanding this process and, and kind of famously in 2020 wrote a paper that basically says leaky gut is the beginning of all disease. Um, and so um, why is not everyone allergic to this? Um, or why doesn't everyone get sick every time they eat gluten? And it turns out that there's a lot of peptidases that are on the sur surface of your 
of your small intestine um, that are able to digest those peptides down to the amino acid level where they don't have any more activity to it. And so I, I bring that up only because um, we do have one mechanism worked out as to how that works. A major um, protease that um, is known to digest these peptides in gluten is called DPP4. Um, and interestingly, autistic um, kids have been taking uh, purified versions of this enzyme for a long time. Um, and it's known that the, a lot of these kids are sensitive to gluten as well. Um, so it offers some protection, but it is a native enzyme. And um, what we found was that when you put glyphosate on these cells, um, this DP4, act, DPP4 activity um, goes down precipitously. And so you then don't digest these peptides. So when we put um, these gluten peptides on cells, they cause cell, cell disruption, tight junction, disassembly, and, um, and uh, that's the beginning of, of a large amount of problems. And so how does glyphosate work in there is like, I think I just said, but if I didn't, it's glyphosate reduces the activity of DPP4, and this is by oxidation. The DPP4 enzyme is very susceptible to oxidation. And so um, that combination is particularly troubling in that glyphosate is sprayed on the very crop, but then um, the combination is easily replicated in, in the lab that that combination disrupts intestine cells. And that seems to be sort of this precipitating common factor for all intestinal diseases. And if you believe Dr. Fasano, all chronic diseases. So just to, to make sure I'm understanding, zonulin in and of itself isn't bad. It, it's opening the tight junctions enough for immune cells to get through. That's an appropriate response. But what happens with gliadin, if it's uh, not broken down, it initiates an overabundance of upregulation of zonulin. DPP-4 actually degrades the, the gliadin such that that doesn't happen. And if there's no DPP-4, then you have this response. Glyphosate reduces the amount of DPP-4. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. It is really complex, um, but thank you for, for taking us through that, John. That's, that's amazing. Um, Jeffrey, I'd love to hear your take on the current health trends, including gluten sensitivity, but current health trends and the possible connection with glyphosate. For, for those who may not be aware, of course, glyphosate is an herbicide and it's part of Roundup, the most popular herbicide in the world. And it's sprayed on many different crops as a desiccant to dry them down, including wheat. But its, it's largest volume is used on genetically engineered crops, many, most of which are Roundup ready. Soy, corn, cotton, canola, sugar beets, and alfalfa have all been genetically engineered as crops not to die when glyphosate-based herbicides are used. So it's these genetic engineering is used to make weeding easier for farmers. And I've been looking for 10 years at the cause of gluten sensitivity and have been looking not only at glyphosate, but also at GMOs, because GMOs themselves have, a, have an impact on the body. And many of the GMOs also produce an insecticide called BT toxin, which I think also supports the uh, eruption of gluten sensitivity in the United States and around the world. So I'm going to share my data of the last 10 years, some of which, most of which I've collected from others, and I'm going to put it all together and we're going to start with charts. Now the chart you're looking at right now is the amount of glyphosate applied to wheat over these year, years and the hospital diagnosis of celiac disease. And this R value is a correlation coefficient. And this is just correlation. It doesn't mean it's causation. It doesn't mean that the glyphosate causes the celiac or the celiac causes the glyphosate. It could be random, et cetera. 
and you need other data in order to put this together. Data like peer reviewed published studies on animals, on humans, clinical trials, self reports, and modes of action. John gave us some excellent modes of action, which might explain these two uh, trends and why they're so, the slopes are so similar. Now, gluten sensitivity is one of many different disorders and diseases that I believe are being promoted by GMOs and Roundup. And I'm just going to go very quickly through other charts. And you'll see that we have inflammatory bowel disease here. It's the glyphosate applied to soy and corn. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through about 30 charts and I'm just going to read the names of the diseases and you can look at the slope to see the correlation. Deaths from intestinal infection. Peritonitis. Deaths from kidney failure. Hepatitis C. Autism prevalence in six year olds. Incidence of diabetes and this has some of these have both the glyphosate line and the percentage of genetically engineered soy and corn crops grown in the United States. Deaths from stroke. Dementia. Deaths from senile dementia. Deaths from Alzheimer's. Deaths from Parkinson's. Deaths from obesity. Deaths due to hypertension. Anemia. Insomnia. Deaths from lipoprotein metabolism disorders, anxiety, schizophrenia, ADHD, bile duct and liver cancer, kidney and renal pelvic cancer, urinary bladder cancer, thyroid incidence, uh, cancer incidence, and deaths due to acute myeloid leukemia. So these are just some of the ones I chose to share. Uh, there are there are plenty of others, but these are the main ones. And uh, I wanted to point out, just as with the first slide, we can't know whether there's a causal relationship unless we have more data. And so the other data might include, for example, and we're just going to focus on one of these uh, in terms of gluten sensitivity. If people start being exposed to glyphosate or GMOs, do they get gluten sensitive? And if people stop being exposed, are they, do they stop having those symptoms? We look at self reports and doctor's reports, and then we look for modes of action. Now I surveyed 3,256 people who reported getting better from 28 different conditions. And this was peer reviewed and published in the International Journal of Human Nutrition and Functional Medicine. And the most common reported improvement was digestive problems, then fatigue, obesity or overweight, brain fog, mood problems like anxiety, depression, food allergies and sensitivities. And we're still above 50% of those responding. But at 42.2%, that's the number of people that reported getting better from gluten sensitivity when they switched to non-GMO and largely organic diets. When you drill down into those 1,375 people who reported that, most reported about 500 significant improvement, nearly gone or completely recovered. In fact, 76% of the respondents were in these categories. And among those survey respondents, 31 were practitioners reporting on their patients. Again, significant improvement, nearly gone and completely recovered were the primary response, responses from, in this case, practitioners reporting on their patients' results. And we've talked to many healthcare professionals like Emily Lindner, who says, based on my clinical experience, when I remove genetically modified foods as part of the treatment for gluten sensitivity, recovery is faster and more complete. So this is an example, and I'm looking for, I've lost the, the ability to stop sharing. <laughs> um, We'll do that in just a second. Um, so these are examples of reports that have occurred from individuals and professionals. So then there's the question of modes of action. And 10 years ago, I was asked by Mary of Mary's Gone Crackers to participate in a press conference in New York City with Mark Hyman and a chef 
It was called Beyond Gluten Sensitivity. And did I have something to contribute? And I said, I believe I do. And I got in touch with gluten guru Tom O'Brien and presented a thesis about how GMOs and Roundup predispose people to gluten sensitivity. And so, um, are we still sharing the screen? No, here we are. Yep, you're good. Okay. So, I proposed that there was an imbalance of gut bacteria, damage to microvilli, reduced digestive enzymes, immune disruption, and intestinal permeability that we could track to GMOs and Roundup. And he confirmed that all of these were precursors to gluten sensitivity. And this became the basis of a gluten brochure, which we created later on. If you could stop sharing my screen, that would be great. I've lost the ability to do that. Great. So I want, and I want to drill down on those modes of action. I know John did an excellent job, but I have a, a, a wider one from the introducing GMOs as well as glyphosate into the mix. Um, and I created a report with the support of Stephanie Seneff and Tom Molter and uh, Sayer G and Tom O'Brien, which we published in 2013. And then Stephanie Seneff and Anthony Samsel created an article on glyphosate and celiac, and those are available at glutenandgmos.com. So among the different five categories which you just looked at, I'm going to review very quickly some of the research. And in terms of the re re reduced ability to break down proteins, John already mentioned that about that one type of enzyme. But glyphosate in general in a study on carnivorous fish showed it reduced the ability for digestive enzymes or the presence of digestive enzymes throughout the digestive system, including protease, which, which would um, break down proteins. Now, GMO soy has an interesting property in that when in cooked GM soy, it has as much as seven times the amount of trypsin inhibitor as non-GMO soy. Trypsin inhibitor inhibits the ability of trypsin to break down proteins. So when you have the genetically engineered soy, you may have a lot, uh, you may have inactivated your, a lot of your trypsin and added to that the fact that the soy contains glyphosate and it's a recipe for disaster. When proteins remain intact longer, they have more likelihood to create an allergic or, or a sensitive response. It's one of the defining aspects of proteins that are allergenic. And when they exist longer, they can putrefy and create excess hydrogen sulfide, which is this toxic as cyanide gas, which irritates and inflames the mucous membranes. And that in turn can increase the amount of CCK, cholecytocytokinin, cholecyto which in turn can reduce more digestive enzymes by the pancreas, and it can become a negative spiral. In addition to that aspect of reduction of digestive capacities, there's a damage to the microvilli, the little fingers on the digestive walls, which can absorb the nutrients. And when there's less absor absorption of nutrients, then the immune system may be less likely to shut off the attacking of gliadin. And the damage to the microvilli was in that fish study for carniv carnivorous fish, damage to the microvilli on the folds of the intestines. And the Bt toxin, which is the insecticide produced in genetically engineered corn, and in South America in soy as well, that has damaged and broken off the microvilli as well. And damaged and broken off microvilli is a characteristic of those with celiac disease. We talked about the leaky gut from glyphosate, but the Bt toxin in the corn kills insects by poking holes in their digestive tract. And in high concentrations in laboratory settings, it can poke holes in human cells as well. So we may have glyphosate creating gaps between the digestive cells and Bt toxin poking holes in the digestive cells. And then there's the activation of the immune system. When we have high load of immune response, we become more sensitive, we become less tolerant. Well, glyphosate promotes that immune response and inflammation, and so does Bt toxin. And that was studied in mice, in rats, and in humans. In fact, with Bt toxin in, in rodents, they, it increases the sensitivity to formerly harmless compounds. 
GMOs can produce uh, all sorts of allergens in many ways uh, by activating proteins like gamazine in Bt corn, by promoting putrazine or cadaverine, uh, by glycosylating proteins. These are all technical terms of how GMOs can increase the immune load and make people more sensitive. And finally, there's the microbiome disruption. Glyphosate itself is an antibiotic. A study that was published this month that looked at a model of the human digestive system and, the, and fed it food for a couple of weeks and then added either Roundup or glyphosate noted the changes in the population of the gut bacteria, short chain fatty acids, et cetera. And I talked to Kieran Christian, who was one of the designers of the study, and we went through those population changes in the gut and compared it to the 28 different conditions that people reported getting better from that you saw in an earlier slide. And he could relate each one of those conditions to changes in the gut bacteria noted in that study, including gluten sensitivity. So again, we have the reduced ability to break down proteins, damage to the microvilli, leaky gut, activation of the immune system, and microbiome disruption. And we have correlational evidence in addition to these modes of action and human reports and animal reports related to each of these modes of action. So it's a pretty significant um, set of data that we can now bring to the discussion, which points to uh, glyphosate and, in my opinion, GMOs as well, as a contributor to the explosion of gluten sensitivity. Awesome. Th thank you, Jeffrey. Just the the uh, unintended consequences, right, that um, as we embark on these new technologies that we just don't think about and then come back. So, um, and those charts are just so impactful. So thank you for sharing those. Um, Dr. Bush, Zach. You were in Washington, D.C. recently to speak with several senators on glyphosate and I believe other desiccants in our agricultural system. Can you speak to that experience and what the future of glyphosate use might look like based on your interaction with those uh, senators? Yeah, fortunately, you know, I, the good news about the way in which government interfaces with technology, such as you know the agricultural system, is you know that it is not very well organized. And so the good news is there's not like an organized effort to put this you know chemical into our food system by our government. And from what's happening is that the government is never the source of ideas. The government is fed ideas by industry, public consumers, voters, and then tries to decide how to make policy that would, you know, help this. And this became very obvious in these recent conversations with senators who are very invested in the food system. They really want a healthy food system, and they really know that it's broken. And, you know, the simple, you know, expose that we've done here from public care today was basically exactly what we were going over with these senators. And the aha moments that kept happening throughout was somewhat astonishing because here they are making you know, dramatic food policy for decades um, and unawares of these issues, but also really encouraging that they are unawares of the issues because as soon as they hear about the issues, they're like, we gotta stop this situation. How do we do this? So, you know, in the end, I really wanna encourage everybody listening that this world has 7.9 billion people on it, most of whom are very well-intentioned. And I believe that about everybody. And I, I think that there, it's very unusual that you find a malignant being that really wants to harm humanity. And so uh, I think that, that there's a hopelessness that sets in as consumers of like, well, there must be some sort of, you know, conspiracy against humanity and the government's trying to kill us and the, they're bought by industry. By and large, they're just not informed well. And this is how I, what I would say about physicians at large. Physicians with my own training being a good example of it. Um, John, I'd be interested for you to speak to this too on the basic science side, but on the clinical side, and you know, I kind of cross between those two. I did both clinical and basic science for you know, many, many decades. And so it felt like uh, it was two decades there in, in academia at different levels. And the issues are that we are taught a, a very narrow perspective on health as physicians and 
Uh, we're given a very small toolbox a narrow belief system about the toolbox as to how we're going to deal with that. So like Kelly was saying with her conditions and see a neurologist and be prescribed, you know, steroids, see rheumatologist over here, Lyme specialist, you know, everybody is so fractionated in their, their training that they can't see the forest for the trees. And when they do see the forest, they get overwhelmed and they say, well, this is my part that I deal with, you know, and so I, I can help you with your skin rash. Here's a top of steroid, you know, whatever it is. And so this is how there's such a gross disconnect between very intelligent, well-meaning people who went into medicine to help people. And the result is the opposite, where people are getting sicker and are getting more and more dependent on medications that are inherently bad for human health. And how did that happen? It happened through an education system that that didn't show the big picture and rewarded people for very narrow thinking. Uh, my, my narrow thinking got so narrow that I was being paid and writing grants on TF1, which nobody's ever heard of and probably nobody ever will hear of because frankly, it's not even important. It's a single protein that is in a mitochondrial cascade that kills cancer and other things you know, if it's functioning well. But it's it's just such a tiny, tiny, tiny piece of the big puzzle. But I wasn't being paid to think globally about cancer. I wasn't. I can't get a grant to think about cancer. I had to get a grant on something that sounded very unique and specialized. And so, because our value system and our funding systems for research and, frankly, clinical care get narrower and narrower, we lose lose any holistic understanding of disease, understanding of you know, treatments that would be holistically minded or whatnot. And more than that, by the time you've moved through your first semester of medical school, that you will never again hear about health. You will only understand disease. And you're taught disease, 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 disease management. In your first semester, you learn physiology and biology and do some of this, you know, kind of what is a healthy cell for six months, and then you move on. And so we need to change the educational system just like we need to change the political system and that the political system needs to, to be oriented not to, to human innovations and companies and technologies, but to simply arrange their legislation around natural systems. So rights of nature, uh, rights of nature, economic uh, frameworks, and then natural law as systems of social and political change would be that pathway towards you know, a very solid foundation. As long as everything is looking back, no matter what sort of policy you're developing, and you're asking the questions, what's its effect on soil, water, and air? Therefore, what's its effect on humans? Therefore, what's its effect on, on the wellness of a society? That would be a way to change you know, politics. In the same way, we could look at natural systems, natural law, and, and the medical system or whatnot. So, uh, in the end, I think that what I would say is it's hopeful that the mess that we're in was not planned. The mess we were in was created by a, a narrow philosophy and, and more and more narrow methods of reward and value within the individuals, whether they be go in government, medicine, farming, the rest. That just resonates with me so much because I, I experienced the same thing in industry. These were not people with all the regulatory people, they had no malintent. In fact, they were trying to make the best of a difficult situation. Um, and it takes zooming out to, to really um, see what's happening because we're all taking care of our, our own little part. And as we continue to do that, we're not gonna make progress. It's really, we have to elevate. So thank you, Zach, that's amazing um, and hopeful, which is great. Um, so we're gonna move to the next area of question. Uh, and this is really around the food system. So with so many developments, um, alterations to the food system in the last century, our relationship with our food has fundamentally changed. And that's like the advent of the of food science, including processed prepackaged foods, um, antibiotics and livestock, things like emulsifiers. These have really complicated our relationship with food as nourishment and medicine. So um, do those kinds of changes have an impact on our ability to digest things such as gluten? Um, and I think, John, we're going to start with you. When we throw out words like prepackaged and processed, as consumers, we know that that's bad. We know we should avoid that. But what's actually happening under the microscope, so to speak, that is so detrimental? 
Yeah, for me, I think the I think the basis of uh, you know again a framing for for this um, concept is that is that um, I like to start by by understanding the combination of the intestines and the kidney um, together as as a system that tries to avoid um, toxins. And so that system is pretty simple if you just combine these simple ideas of um, when you eat something, um, you digest them into small particles, and then your intestines job in the very simplistic way is to um, take up the things that they know what they are. So there's specific transporters, um, you know, binding factors to pull in all the nutrients that you know you need. Um, everything else is supposed to go by. Um, an interesting part of that is that um, the things that are going by, if it happens to be a bunch of things that aren't supporting your microbiome, you're actually sending these particles that are not absorbed um, down to your intestines, your large intestines that are meant to ferment um, of non-digestible foodstuffs that, that can then be turned into something that's useful for you. And probably an, an interesting uh, connection there that a lot of people know is that these bacteria that in your, are in your intestines um, convert indigestible fibers into a number of molecules that are then transported and absorbed. Um, Butyrate being a central one that a lot of people are becoming aware of, and um, those that microbiome and production of butyrate, and um, that in combination with the bacteria that are are um, um, supporting the production of mucus um, or um, other such things that makes your intestines healthy. Um, that disruption that goes on the microbiome is 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 a central feature here. Okay, so with, now we have all these all of these molecules that are absorbed through the small and large intestine, circulating and de being delivered to every cell in your in your body. Um, each one of those cells is producing um, byproducts that need to be taken away, and then again. Um, transported back into the bloodstream and then filtered by your kidney. And then it actually happens again. All the all those small molecules that um, need to be recouped are bound in the cells that uh, are just past the filter of the kidney and then are reabsorbed again. And so that double filtration of trying to keep just the things that are necessary for keeping the individual cells in the body um, happy and healthy um, and all the rest are gotten rid of. Um, and so it's in within, within that context of um, understanding that this toxic burden that's, that's increasing slowly over time is that um, anything that decreases your ability to actually move those toxins um, will tend to make them accumulate. And so I think one of the places to start here is um, in the lab, we figured out that um, glyphosate actually blocks a very central enzymatic system called NRF2. Um, you may not be familiar with that particular um, enzyme complex, but um, its job is to, is to um, get rid of reactive oxygen species. These are oxidant molecules that damage tissue. And then they also are the um, detoxification system, phase one, two, and three of detoxification. So uh, it's interesting that a toxin has this particularly um, nasty ability to turn off the system for monitoring and getting rid of toxins. So it's, I, I put it in this category of being like a master toxin that allows every other toxin to be more toxic. And so this disrupt disruption of um, the ability to get rid of toxins um, and then accumulating inside cells um, is, is working in two main ways. Um, uh, there's been, you know, discussion since the 1960s is, is it, is it toxins that um, uh, cause DNA damage 
or is it lack of micronutrients? Um, because it's hard to distinguish between those two because both of them lead to the same thing, which is called um, uh, genome instability. So you accumulate mutations. And um, so both of those actually happen at the same time with glyphosate and gluten is you mess up the, the, the system of detoxification and you mess up the ability of the cells that are lining your intestine and your, and your kidney their ability to get rid of toxins. And so you're get, not getting rid of toxins, and then you're also messing up the ability to absorb micronutrients. And I think that's kind of the snowball that just goes crazy with every single toxin that's introduced into our atmosphere. Um, it ends up, um, because of glyphosate being this master, master toxin, every other toxin becomes worse and accumulates more and more. And that's the, that's the snowball we're all experiencing right now. Wow, so it's um, more and more toxins coming at us and we have less ability to process those toxins as a result of master toxin glyphosate, right? So thank you, John. That's, um, I don't know how you took such a complex topic and you distilled it down to something understandable. So thank you, appreciate that. Uh, Jeffrey, I know a lot of your focus is GMOs, um, which is a, a big part of our current food system. Um, I'm, I'm hoping you can touch on that a little bit in terms of trends that you see and what are you most fearful of? Well, thank you. Uh, I'm actually not fearful. I'm hopeful. Good. And I have a lot of, I have plans to turn things around. So I'm about to share some information which may appear disturbing, but we are, we are uh, rallying to the cause here. Um, there's a new type of create, way of creating GMOs called gene editing. In the past, when you wanted to create a GMO, you would load a gene gun or use certain bacteria to smuggle genes into a random place in the genome. Now you can, for example, CRISPR, you can create a genetic scissors and a genetic guide, which looks for a particular sequence along the genome and makes a cut. And then the repair mechanism of the cell will put it back together and sometimes it'll knock out genes or add things or change things according to what the scientists want. But more often than they want to admit, it, there's side effects. In fact, the number one most common result of genetic engineering, either the traditional or gene editing, are these side effects. The um, Nature publication described three studies of using CRISPR on human uh, embryos and called it chromosomal mayhem, cutting in the wrong place, creating excess mutations. There's epigenetic changes. There's the possibility of chromothripsis where there's a shattering of the genome and coming back together in a haphazard manner. Um, I've directed a six minute animation that we're releasing at the Institute for Responsible Technology as early as next week, which describes what actually happens in the genome as a result of gene editing. We're creating it because the biotech industry has been fraudulently representing gene editing as safe, precise, and even natural. And they've convinced governments, including the United States, Canada, the UK, India, Australia, Brazil, Argentina, Japan, and others to deregulate gene editing to either a complete degree or some large degree, which means that you can create a new GMO using gene editing and introduce it into the environment or our food supply without telling consumers and in many cases without even telling the government. When you release a GMO into the environment, it can be permanent, it can make a permanent change in the gene pool, and it's easy to now gene edit. It's so cheap and easy, you can buy a do-it-yourself kit online for $169 to use CRISPR in a rudimentary way, but for a couple of thousand bucks, you can have your own lab with a lot of flexibility. As time goes on, the power of CRISPR will go up, the cost will go down, and it'll be used by virtually every high school science class. So we're talking about a system now where there's virtually a democratization of the nature's gene pool. So we've arrived at that inevitable time in human civilization where we can easily, individually redirect the streams of evolution for all time with a technology prone to side effects and no way to recall it. 
when you're not informing the government or consumers about your gene editing, these GMOs will overwhelm organics and they'll overwhelm non-GMO products and we will lose our choice. Among all the different kingdoms that we're now gene editing or genetic engineering, the most dangerous are microbes. We can guess without much difficulty how gain of function of potentially pandemic microbes might cause problems, but even any type of microbe that you genetically engineer has the ability to create risk, which we think is unacceptable. When you genetically engineer a microbe, it can replicate, travel, mutate, swap genes with other types of microbes, and enter ecosystems throughout the planet, including inside human beings. The microbiome is precious. We outsource the majority of our chemical and uh, metabolic functions to the microbiome. We can get away with a measly 22,000 genes less than earthworms because we use the microbial information in the 3.5 million genes in the microbiome living inside us. However, small changes in the microbiome can lead to disease. It's estimated that up to 80% of diseases are linked to early changes in the microbiome. So what happens when you release a genetically engineered microbe for soil remediation in Arkansas, and it ends up in an infant gut in Alaska or a nursing mother in Europe, we are playing with the microbiome, which we only have characterized less than 1%. And yet what we have learned has created awe and wonder. We have been co-evolving with these micro, with this micro Jedi army working on our behalf for as long as humans have existed. And yet we are now risking the integrity of that microbiome. At the Institute for Responsible Technology, we've taken up the cause of protecting the global microbiome and also supporting all of the groups around the world who are trying to reinstall or create proper regulation of gene editing, not just for the food supply, but so we don't replace nature in this generation and not allow future generations to inherit the products of the billions of years of evolution, but instead adhere, uh, inherit the products of laboratory creations prone to side effects. Fortunately, this is an easy problem to convey. It's not difficult. People get it. In fact, uh, Homeland Security, Department of Defense, national security experts have long said that the technology has outpaced regulation. So we are looking to install regulation that locks down and protects the microbiome and changes the way we interact with nature, our food, and life. It's basically taking the kind of awe and wonder that you get when you listen to Dr. Zach Bush talk about the microbiome and then stepping in and protecting that intelligence of nature for all living beings and all future generations. If you'd like to see a 16 minute film uh, called Don't Let the Gene Out of the Bottle about the dangers to the microbiome, please go to protectnaturenow.com. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you, Jeffrey. I hadn't heard that, that 80% of conditions could be traced back to the microbiome, but I, I guess it doesn't surprise me based on everything I'm learning. So um, I'm glad that you're hopeful. Um, Kelly, uh, from a political perspective and as a consumer who has essentially taken on a lot of these issues into your own hands, um, why would you say it's so difficult to make change and and kind of what are the pressures that the average consumer is under from the media and culturally and so on why is it so hard to make progress so this the ch changing one's diet just is su such an intimate thing really to even try and address and and i think what's really hard is there are a lot of us who have been through this journey that have found this bright light of health and you're so excited about it. And you see this explosion of new like functional nutrition programs and health coaching programs. And, and it's because so many of us are so excited to spread this information and which is wonderful. And I, I'm so thrilled about it. And I imagine that a lot of people can understand the feeling of, um, so I was at Sweet Green, Sweet Greens the other day. And I saw the person at the checkout and she had that same red rash that I get. Okay. <laughs> and I'm like, oh my gosh, I really, really want to tell this person she needs to go gluten-free. I'm like, that's the gluten rash. But I've learned from friends who have 
told me that they don't want to know about being gluten-free, that that's not a good idea to go around suggesting like they change their lifestyle entirely. Um, it, I mean, this is to a point that I've had friends that have been diagnosed with an autoimmune condition, but still are not interested in going gluten-free and don't want to talk to me about it. And the, part of the thing is that if there's a medication that's going to treat the symptoms and they treat well enough, then it's not human nature to just want to go ahead and take that route and then continue enjoying. I mean, for a lot of people, the best part of their day is being able to enjoy glutinous things. And so giving that up is really, you know, giving up a big part of happiness. And it's interesting because, you know, so when someone like me and the other people that are here and all the wonderful people doing great work on, on this food front and you try and inspire and, but if people are willing to medicate and go that route, then they're not going to put the pressure on the industrial, uh, industrialized chemical, like the ag chem situation that we have going on in our heartland in, in American agriculture, the pressure just isn't there. So it really is going to be coming from the consumer to hopefully want to dig into what the root causes are of their illness, and then hopefully make the change. And um, what's frustrating is this constant battle sort of in my background actually is in, is in investment banking of all things. So I have a corporate background and I'm not anti-corporation. However, the the chain of profits that Bayer has built um, based upon poisoning and then treating is just really, really hard for me to reconcile. And Bayer bought, for those who don't know, Bayer purchased Monsanto. Um, and so now, for example, Bayer has a venture capital arm. And so they recently invested um, in a company that is creating an alternative gluten so that people like me will be able to eat gluten again. And, and they also invested in a company called Mozart Technologies that is creating um, pharmaceuticals that will help people with very specific um, autoimmune conditions. And, you know, like it's hard because of course you want that, like I want that alternative gluten and I am happy that people can find resolution to their symptoms with these pharmaceuticals. And that's wonderful. At the same time, it's creating this whole circle of profit where they're causing the illness by continuing to spray these things and create the GMOs and sell the GMOs. And then they're treating it on the other side. And it's just very, very hard to break sort of that, that chain of thought. Um, and another big pressure that people that are gluten fair have these food sensitivities face is there's a great deal of social pressure. Like it's embarrassing. You go to a restaurant and you have to be the one that has to ask exactly how something was prepared and then calculate, okay, is it worth that risk? Cause I know I have a meeting in two days and I'm going to be asleep and have that red dot on my face if I don't plan ahead. Um, and if they're not telling the truth. And so there's a lot that goes on and I actually had my kids go gluten-free and they had a resolution. My son had really crippling migraines and he was dealing with ADHD. Uh, my daughter had digestive problems. And when I had them go gluten-free and primarily organic as much as we could, they had resolution to that. And a friend of mine has a son who has Crohn's disease and he is two. So this toddler has Crohn's disease, which, but, you know, it blows my mind, although I was speaking to a pediatrician. Now this is becoming more common that these diseases you barely even saw in adults before when, you know, I was a teenager now in a two-year-old. And so I was discussing, you know, have you thought about gluten? And, and she said, actually, the doctors have recommended that he go gluten-free. However, I'm not going to do that to him because the social pressure is once he gets to school of having to have a different diet would be too much. And I'm just... I'm baffled at weighing that, you know, really severe autoimmune condition and not being willing to make those dietary changes. Um, and uh, so you know, there's just so, there's so much that it goes behind this. And I'm really happy to see that there is this influx of health coaching. So I think that's really where it's going to come from to, to instigate this behavior change, because it's just a really hard transition for most people to make. And so much emotion is latent in it. And so um, I'm happy to see more people going that route. That's a, that's shocking, actually, um, uh, Kelly. But I, I guess one positive is so many people are now gluten sensitive that it is going to become more uh, accepted to say that at the restaurant and there'll be more options, but um, yeah, if we could get to root cause, right? That's really where we would wanna be. So um, Dr. Bush, Zach, we've been focusing a lot on the toxins and the adulterations of our foods. Um, is there something we should be concerned on in terms of what's missing in our food system 
versus what's actually being added to our food? Yeah, it's an critical question because I think this is where we kind of start to get at the solutions for how, how do we reverse ourselves out of this you know, extinction level stress that we put on the planet and on humanity through the undermining of the microbiome. And maybe, maybe as a beginning, I'm just going to do a quick overview of, you know, summarizing everything we've heard so far, because it gets overwhelming, like to start to everything we've heard on mechanisms of action all the way to the big population statistics between John and Jeffrey. Basically, we started, you know, this even before life say we started a war on the microbiome, not even having that word in our lexicon. So post-World War II, we start turning our attention from chemical warfare to chemical agriculture. And that was just a simple shift in socioeconomics. We had revved up the massive you know, global oil industry to such an extraordinary level with this mechanized war that we called World War II, that when that ended, we had this glut of you know, oil and its you know, potential downstream derivatives from the chemical industry from fossil fuel and petroleum. And so what happened is the chemical industry suddenly had very cheap access to raw materials to put into play a whole host of things, both in farming and in human health. And so we saw a huge acceleration of innovation in chemical fertilizers, herbicides, pesticides, and this became known as the Green Revolution. And what we inadvertently did in this time is we put ourselves at war with the microbiome. So we started adding chemicals to our soil systems that undermined the amount of biodiversity that we had in bacteria, fungi, protozoa, and the like. That ultimately trickled down quite quickly, especially within a generation of humans to undermining the soil within us. And so we started losing the biodiversity and soil systems within the human gut by the 1980s. And that really accelerated in the 1990s. And so the loss of the soil system led to our vulnerability that would lead to the breakdown and digestion of all these peptides that John was talking about, and then ultimately lead to the chronic inflammatory conditions that Jeffrey has demonstrated to us. So we basically just lost the intelligence of the soil, both on the planet and in, in, in human biology. And we did this at the same time. So in, in the last 50 years of the last century, you know, from 1952 to today, 70 year period, we lost 97% of the vitality of arable soils or farmable soils on the planet. At the same time, we wiped out 97% of indigenous peoples in our cultures. And so we really annihilated biodiversity from the tiny microbes all the way to human experience, culture, society, uh, through a, a monotony of monoculture. And the monoculture is in the cornfield and it's on your Instagram you are being programmed with monoculture experience every day. And for that, we're suffering a, a shutting down of the lights on the system. And so how do we back up? How do we back up? And then how do we leap forward? You know, so we can back up to the 1940s, pre-green pre revolution and say, okay, what was in the human experience within our soil systems that existed then that's missing now? And the answer is microbes and all of the goodness that they would put into the soil system. So, the intelligence of nature as a brand, as a laboratory, you know, John and all the other scientists that have worked on this over the years, as well as other labs around the world have come to understand these large carbon molecules that are made by bacteria and fungi in diverse ecosystems really are the underpinning of life. And the way in which life occurs is ultimately communication. And so what we uncovered in 2012 and 13 was the opportunity to utilize these large carbon molecules by made by bacteria and fungi to carry information in the form of electrical energy. And so just like a liquid circuit board would be, so the circuit board in your computer chip allows a lot of pattern recognition to occur and trafficking of information across switches and I's and O's, in the same way your gut or cell, your system uses a liquid circuit board to traffic information. And so we found in, in the soil systems and in, in soil science articles and rash, these large carbon molecules that if hydrogen can bind back to it correctly, allow for this traffic of electrical information. So we started working with that in 2013 in the labs and John was the first to demonstrate this extraordinary reality that when you get enough communication into a cellular environment, repair happens at a rate that is unprecedented. And so ultimately when we start to think about how did we get to disease, we lost soil intelligence, i.e. soil communication. When we lost soil communication, we lost gut communication, we lost gut communication, 
we developed a, a diminished capacity for repair and our rate of injury exceeded our rate of repair and we developed a chronic disease epidemic that exceeded that. And so when we start to think about a food system of the future, a soil system of the future, a society of the future, we're gonna reverse that. We're gonna repair faster than we're injuring. And to do that, we're going to have to start to reintegrate these complex microbial experiences, these, these incredible and intelligent systems of carbon matrix and their interplay with water and light energy within the systems to create this vitality on the planet and within the planet. And so that's what we've been doing with ION. We extract these large carbon molecules from 60 million year old soil. And then we use a number of mineral catalysts to get the hydrogen bonding such that we get an electrical experience or a redox chemistry out of this thing. And with that, you see this communication phenomenon occur. And so when we do this, we're not treating anything. It doesn't treat a disease. It doesn't fix anything. It instead accelerates communication at the cellular level. And the beauty that I see in coming out of our lab every day, uh, Ji Shen is our, our MD PhD out of China that works in our lab every day. And he's just a master at the bench top. And he's the, the repetition of science that we do today in our laboratory just boggles the mind at how easy it is to repeat these things to an extremely accurate level of efficacy. And what we see again and again is that when cells are introduced to information or they can communicate seamlessly, they do things over and over again that we couldn't expect. They upregulate DPP4, they upregulate you know, your whole antioxidant cascade down the room. They, they downregulate the inflammatory cascades. They upregulate apoptosis and damage cells. They upregulate uh, the the senescence, uh, the destruction of senescent cells. Like it, it's just like everything we've ever looked at that's bad when given enough access to information becomes resolved instantly. And so John has done this over and over again, Ji Shen, and, and you know it's just been you know week on week. It just has been ten years of jaw dropping science to show us that nature is so potent at repair that we have not found in it. We've done radiation studies in our skin product that we've developed. You radiate cells with you know, the radiation that you see from, from uh, high dose sunshine and, and it can overcome this. And so it, it, from radiation to glyphosate, we can overcome those injuries in matters of seconds at the cellular level, which is so dumbfounding to me that glyphosate for everything you've heard today is so horrific and yet nature in the split seconds created the antidote to that, you know, that, that in split seconds repairs the mechanism because of just the capacity of information. Share information and cells know how to repair an infant item. And so I'm very encouraged by the decade of science that we have not invented a toxin that can overcome the power of repair that nature has engineered into every single human cell. We are a biologic miraculous system of regeneration. We, people, we, plant it, planet, we, soil systems, all of it has a resilience and a regenerative capacity that we've shown again and again in the, in the lab defies anything we learned in physiology. Physiology says things break, and once they break, they're very difficult to repair. That's not what we see when we put human cells back into relationship with nature. And it's interesting that John and I and every other scientist have spent our, our career studying human cells in isolation. And then we decide they can't repair. So we understand cancer only in isolation. We understand cardiovascular disease only in isolation. We put in the communication network of biology of the microbes back into a human cellular system. There's no bacteria, there's no fungi. It's just the communication network of the microbiome. And you suddenly see a resiliency and a repair rate that just could not have been fathomed in your typical basic science. And so we only understand the human condition in isolation. Therefore, we have come to believe in, in the inevitability of disease. Plug the human back into nature. And the only thing that is inevitable is repair. Repair, regeneration. And Cindy, you have lived this. Kelly, you have lived, lived this. You know, multi-system shutdown, you know, whole, whole systems failing to thrive. And then within minutes, within days, Cindy, I think it was like within a single day, you were suddenly like, wait, something's happening. Within three days, you know, a decade of decline had reversed. How does three days not only make up for, but surpass the damage of 10 years? And the answer is you have innate health within you that needs to be unleashed. And the way to unleash it is allow cells to talk to each other seamlessly. 
And I think it's nature's design, miraculous design, that our communication network for regeneration is not human, it is microbial. This is the checks and balances of human biology. If we go on to be so narcissistic and separate ourselves from nature and extract the vitality of the plant, then we will die. For our very health depends on the communication of the microbiome. It's a very nice design of nature to make sure that one species doesn't get out of hand. It's showing us that one species is, is not alone. One species cannot dominate the planet. There is no such thing as monoculture in the life within the universe. It has to be biodiverse. It has to be you know, biophysically diverse. And so I'm very excited that our laboratory has been able to reveal a the healing potential that far exceeds the speed of the diseaseification. And B, we are not alone in our effort towards health. The planet is here to serve us, to, to rapidly embrace us with grace for all the mistakes and, and you know, horrific injuries we've, we've applied to her. Here we are applying 2 billion kilograms of life, say, to global soils annually now. And in her soil 60 million years ago, she plants the antidote to the poison we're pouring out on her today. That is a deep story of grace that is humbling and I think inspiring to, to consider. Mm, amazing, Zach, that, that's amazing. And I, um, I think for me personally, uh, I had treated myself with so many pharmaceuticals that, that I would never have thought I could recover from that much damage just from the pharmaceuticals. Yet this combination of microbes and humic extract and fulvate that combination, it's really that partnership with, with the human, right? That is the magic, not just the microbes. They need, they need that, that, uh, that humic extract to have that three legs of the stool, however you want to put it. But I think you just worded that so well. Thank you um, for taking us back on that whole journey. Um, I would love to actually get John to respond to that because I'm uh, sorry to, to <laughs> maybe diverge, but John, you know, I think if there was one thing I wish I could bottle up and share with the public at large around the world is the excitement that you and I have gotten to share at different times and, the, and just the mind blowing, just like awe of the beauty that we get to see in the lab you know, month by month over these, this decade. Can you just share a little bit of what that experience has been for you as a scientist to heal back, you know, sh shifting out of, you know, your background in genetics and renal physiology and everything else, and then shifting into this, this soil world, what that's been like for you? Yeah, I think I, I have a, I probably have a common story. Um, it, with sickness and that was that was my sister um she passed away very young um she worked in a in a doctor's office and literally died um right in front of an entire medical staff and she was gluten sensitive like common theme here and um i think the sad part about that was that because she was so engaged in that system, she never tried to look outside of it. And you know, people don't know that if you if you're non-celiac gluten sensitive and and you um, are not careful with avoiding gluten, um, there's some really terrible statistics. You know, like your um, life expectancy is decreased sixfold um, if you if you're taking in gluten knowingly, you know, over, I think it's three times per month. So you're, you're damaging the very core of this, this relationship that's in between um, what we always talk about is this, this interaction that's happening at the root system at plants, the light that's hitting the plant, and then the opposite system there, or convergent system where you have bacteria right outside um, the microvilli that look just like the villi that are on the plants and you're transporting nutrients and you are converting, you know, electrochemical energy in the plant to the bacteria to communication molecules that happens back in your intestine again. Um, 
it is miraculous when you get something back into balance how how well it works um i'll probably talk about my 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 injury that is is still with me is that is that she, she didn't even know i was interested in how you know the world works and things and and being unknown by your own sibling is is a is a hard hard thing to swallow and and so some part of me at that point decided I was going to make sure I shared it and that the people around me knew at least what I felt. Um, I'd like to share a, a, a story that I think was one of my blow me away uh, moments was um, I think uh, my favorite is I was I was looking at tight junctions and the molecule Z01. And we had already played with small amounts of glyphosate and and seen that it disrupts tight junctions. But you know, just to be thorough, we're always trying to push the boundaries. So you, you throw in a couple of experiments in, in the lab and and um, we wanted to see how fast we can break down tight junctions. So we put you know 10 milligrams per mil of, of uh, glyphosate on cells and it was something like 16 seconds, the uh, the tight junctures are completely disassembled. And just because I'm doing this in 96 well plates and and you know have a lot of data points to play with, like I threw on ion also um, on every dilution. And I was completely like almost standing up and dancing when I saw store completely block the tight junction disruption. Um, looked like it instantly killed the cells. And I just didn't understand how that could possibly be. You know, it's it's binding up how many minerals and things at that concentration on a um, culture of cells. And um, and yeah, so it just, just blew me away that that, that that would happen. So it completely blocked the that, that super high concentration of glyphosate. And then, I was like, well, this, I mean, it has to be doing something equally bad on its own. So then I, I made salt culture media with 100% ion. So it was 100% ion just in powdered media. And I put it on cells and I expected them to again, die in the opposite direction as, as fast as possible. Um, yet I put those, those, that, super high 100% concentration of ion on cells with, with the intention that they were going to die instantly and then compared it to just regular culture media. Um, and I left it on for five days. There was no cell death. Like you can, couldn't find an LD50 for this, this molecule. Just, so the combination of those two were just amazing. And, and, I really loved my daughter's response to that when I went home and told her about the response was anybody that came over to our house where we're, you know, explaining nutrition and health with them. Um, we do that all the time is my daughter would walk out with her little spray bottle of, of ion and in the middle of this conversation, she would open her eye out really wide and spray it right on her eye. <laughs> Like that's live cells. You're spraying it right on live cells, and boy, did that gets people's attention. Like the confidence of a you know eight year old taking the product that he's heard um, her dad talk about being miraculous, and you know wanted to share it, and just you know that's kind of the way that it's been all along. Is is that you can take out a whole level of problems by adding a little bit of armor to your to your small and large intestines by making those tight junctions tight and you know it, sh it really should be a part of part of um, anybody who's in this particular environment that we're in right now you going organic and and gluten free there's still so many things that are that are invading um, our body that uh, that you need you need to be armored against Amazing. Thank you, John. Thank you for sharing all that. Um, I had heard bits and pieces, but 
to hear it all together. That was a pleasure. And um, I think ion, the science of ion, it's one of those things you can't unsee it, right? Once you, you start to see what, what happens under the microscope, it's pretty miraculous. So um, thank you. Um, we're going to shift just a, just a little bit for the last series of questions and start with um, Kelly and then Jeffrey. Kelly, um, what can we do to help people who suffer from gluten sensitivity or want to avoid gluten and glyphosate for themselves or family members? I mean, we've talked a lot, but like, what are their best practices? What would your recommendations be to the person listening of how to navigate? Anything sure. Well, so first following on um, John, I mean, John, that is such a story. Oh my gosh, like I'm over here in tears and particularly because I feel like I was, I was your sister. Like I, it really was very dismal. And I was, you know, to the point of writing letters to my young children that like, this is it. And, and I felt like I was there until fortunately this discovery. And I, and so thank you so much for all you do and to all of you guys for all you do to bring attention to this so that it prevents less illness. I mean, it's just, I can say go gluten-free as often as I want, but you're the one that are showing the substance behind. So thank you. Um, in terms of best practices. So uh, I, I, and I actually made my whole kitchen gluten-free and my whole family just had to go along with it because of those small cross contaminations that just are unavoidable. Um, and so, you know, no sharing toasters with anyone that had, just like if you had celiac disease, you hear about how strict that is, like making sure no surfaces are shared with gluten. Um, and always checking labels for surprise places where you might find it. I actually had a reaction to a conditioner, um, a hair conditioner that had a, a brand in it, a wheat brand. And um, so it's checking all of those things. And one thing that I've noticed is men who have gluten sensitivity tend to be even more embarrassed to ask at a restaurant <laughs> because they don't want to seem weak or whatever it is. Um, I mean, I don't either, but men seem to have more of an issue with it. Uh, and so one thing that's helpful that I recommend is calling the restaurant ahead if you're going to be with a group, because um, if you're going to a business dinner or whatever it is, and you don't want to make a big scene, it's easy to call and see what's going to be gluten-free so that you know when you place your order that it's going to be safe for you. And then you don't have to seem odd. And um, just another side note, and, and when I was doing all this, I actually, this was now probably six years ago, five or six years ago that I fell sick. And actually, John and Zach, you guys, I, and my big, big search for information on gluten sensitivity, there was like one white paper that you guys had because very little was out yet. And I was like, what's this? What's this person talking about? So I'm so excited more people know about it. Um, but uh, one thing to be sure that you're doing is checking your B vitamins because there's a lot of things you're no longer getting when you move over into a gluten-free diet. I actually didn't know that, but I did suddenly find myself very deficient in B1. So I am constantly kind of supplementing that. Um, but obviously just check with your doctor with your blood levels and see what, what they are. Um, finally, I just, you know, the, none of us asked to have this condition and it's, it could be a real bummer, but I've, I've opted and so many people I know have opted to turn it around and think of it as more of a gift because it's made me focus more on my overall health. And John, as you were saying, glyphosate is just one part of the picture. Like there are a lot of things that we need to be concerned about in terms of our health. And I certainly wouldn't have been, I still would have had my little mini Oreos in my little car cup if this hadn't happened to me. And that probably would have led to a shorter life and a life that's much, much less just real and vivid. And in terms of reconnecting with nature and starting to understand it, planting my own garden now. So there are a lot of benefits that come with this intolerance that I would encourage people to embrace and, and life can still be, be beautiful with it. So, you know, just go easy on yourself too, because I know the dark, dark depths of illness and you feel like you're never going to get out. And once you do get out, life is just absolutely so spectacular. Like you never see it the same way. Again, everything is just in just hyper color beauty. And, and that is a huge gift that I've had. And I know so many people that have had illnesses have had a similar experience. Mm, Kelly, that was amazing. Um, and you are a gift and you bringing your story and your strength and your willingness to go there um, is a gift to all of us. So thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, Jeffrey, any final thoughts that you have uh, in terms of what we can do as consumers, um, 
many of us with gluten sensitivity or other health conditions? Yes. Um, first of all, I'm very inspired by everyone in the panel today. It's It's been so fun to hear this deep dive into experience and science. Um, I get I get the chance to inspire people to eat organic. Uh, originally, I was focusing on non-GMO and saying, well, eat organic if, if you can. And then I realized that glyphosate was sprayed on a lot of non-GMO products as well. So I would say eat organic. And if you have to eat non-organic, at least eat non-GMO and avoid those foods where glyphosate is found in high concentrations. And at responsibletechnology.org, we have a, a database of everyone's compilation, everyone's test on how much gluten, I mean, excuse me, how much glyphosate residues are in this particular food or this particular food, both the, the raw ingredients and in some cases the, the name brands. Whatever people do, we put it into that database. So you can go to responsibletechnology.org or more easily, eat organic because organic doesn't allow either GMO or glyphosate as well as many other uh, serious chemicals. Now, non-GMO Project Verified, I love them. They're great. I think they're the best verification program. But if you have a non-GMO verified bowl of oatmeal, oatmeal is non-GMO, but oats are sprayed with Roundup or glyphosate-based herbicides just before harvest and they could be drenched in glyphosate. So we say, Eat organic. Eat organic, take notes and tell others. When I say take notes, you may go in to eat organic because you have a specific rash or you have something with your stomach or whatever. You may not realize that your level of energy is being influenced because as Zach and John know, the mitochondria can be damaged from glyphosate, which is your energy, which can relate to your, your energy level and the brain fog. You may not realize that your mood may change, your sensitivity to other things may change. So when I say take notes, create a spreadsheet, put your every day, your energy level, your mood and every condition you have one to 10 and what percentage of, of your food is organic. And if you're also going uh, gluten-free, note that. And if you're taking ion or other supplements for this, note that, and then watch what happens. Watch what happens to all of the conditions because that's going to convince you more than anything, because it turns out it's a holistic change. You may forget how tired you were or about some symptom that you had years ago before you started. And then you can tell others, because just as communication is the basis for intracellular health, and as John talked about talking about what he's looking at, telling others, and Kelly telling others, tell others what you've discovered so that they also will come up to you as they come up to me all the time and say, you saved my life or you saved my family. And I remember this is for Zach and John. I was in a health food store in Florida and someone came up to me and said, you saved my life, you and Restore or Ion. <laughs> and then she said she was in the hospital and she had digestive problems and she took it and immediately felt a difference within moments. And so that was the first time I had to share the stage with you guys <laughs> in terms of feedback. Now, if you go to, <clears throat> if you've taken the suggestion that, that I gave earlier and you go to protectnaturenow.com and you watch that 16 minute film about the dangers of genetically engineered microbes, it's absolutely stunning. It starts off with one microbe that was altered and if it had been released as planned, it could have theoretically ended terrestrial plant life. There's another one that could have theoretically altered weather patterns. So there's, it's a very serious existential threat. And I don't want to create fear, anger, sadness, etc. Rather, this is kind of parallel to what Kelly said earlier <clears throat> about the disorder becoming, becoming grateful for the disorder. Many people receive prognoses that are very serious, and ultimately they are blessings. Somehow the looking at their mortality or some kind of prolonged illness causes them to act and think differently. And that then gives them more life than they've ever had. And that prognosis becomes the blessing. I think consciousness of society is nonlinear and non-local. 
that humanity can leap forward just as individuals can. And I think we're at that time where we're looking at problems like genetic engineering, like life, say, like, so, like the damage to the microbiome, which on the one hand carry a very serious prognosis. But on the other hand, it can become the catalyst for transformation. It starts with individuals. It ends up as a collective. So I'd like to invite people to completely buy into the concept that the information you're receiving about the threats is an invitation to step above that, to take responsibility for nature, take responsibility for your health, share this information. Because sharing this information isn't just about telling that one other person and another person. It's creating that critical mass so that we as, an, as a collective organism can get it. We see this in nature all the time. A certain number of cells in the heart line up and beat together and the rest of the, of the heart beats together. A certain number of, of iron filings become aligned, the rest becomes a magnet. There's phase transitions. So what I see now is we have a situation where we may hit the wall in a lot of areas and I, I'm not depressed by it, I'm not fearful. I'm thinking this is what we need to step up to a new level of humanity. And I wanna thank all the panelists for, we're, I, we're all sort of doing our work. I think we started off by saying, saying before we have went to air, we're all doing our, our planet saving work. And I think it's true. And I think I would invite everyone to take that angle and be part of this massive solution so that all that you've heard in terms of the threat becomes a blessing to us all. Thank you. Jeffrey, you hit from the micro to the macro, which I love uh, the micro. I, I love this idea of journaling, like keeping track. Um, and that was very helpful to me in my journey. And, um, and then taking it all the way up to, um, you know, this is a collective and we all need to do our part. And you're certainly a, a man of action. And, and thank you. Thank you for everything that you've done um, and sharing all the information that you share. Um, I almost hate to ask this question because I feel like we're, we're, we're sharing such rich high level thought, but I'd be remiss in not um, asking John, if you could, you, you know, you spearheaded foundational science for ion relating both to glyphosate and gluten. You were talking about that at the gut lining and how ion intervenes. And you talked about earlier what's happening with, with gluten and glyphosate, but we, we, I don't know that we specifically walk through how ion in that specific issue is helping. Um, maybe you could hearken back to that conversation and just say molecularly, where does ion fit in? Yeah, so I think the um, the the best way to understand um, that system is is kind of what I was relating to earlier is that is that you you need you need you know all the the, the nutrients in, uh, in an amount that makes a cell and group of cells act um, correctly. Um, anytime that, that you're missing micronutrients, you start turning off functions. And so I think that's how I understand how, how ion interver intervenes. Um, uh, I know Zach is 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 better on the physics world and the and the uh, and sort of smaller than than molecule world where I I tend to reside, um, and I'd love to hear his his answer to the same question. But um, how I see it is is anytime you have a nutrient deficiency, you're turning off a function. One of the functions that's often turned off is is genome maintenance. I mean when genome maintenance is not is not kept up to snuff. You're you're turning on and off genes that are that are necessary for proper function. And so, what is what is ion doing in that context? So, it's providing one of the things that I know it does really well is it acts like a carrier molecule for um, for uh, uh, minerals ions. And so, you're getting ions that usually have difficulty moving around um, and getting through membranes and into the places where they're needed and, and seeded inside of um, enzymes so that they, they, 
they work properly. Um, for, for some reason, kind of an unknown reason, when you, you give a toxin to, to a cell, um, you're poisoning some component of that of that cell. So it's it's reacting in a way that it, it's self-preservation. Um, it's pulling its pulling its connection to its neighbors and and um, becoming very selfish and just saying, I'm I'm sacrificing my future, um, which is you know your ability to to turn on and off genes um to survive the moment i'm turning off systems so that i can survive this this onslaught of of um, invaders and then and then i think the the issues with with just known functions of ion is that it it turns on the ability to deal with toxins so activating nrf2 it's it's turning on a whole bunch of enzymes that that block the effects of of the the toxin you get reactive oxygen species generation that takes care of you start uh, most cells have the ability to secrete cytokines um, which is inflammation turns that off and so it just happens to turn on three pathways that are kind of in the middle of every um dysfunction that that's out there and it works in the cells that are seem to be the front line you know when you're eating um food that's that's has tons of poisons and at the first cells it sees is the lining of your digestive tract because that's essentially your outside world um your contact with the outside world and so just the fact that it affects those cells so dramatically um I think that's that's how it works. And then to go right to the specific function I was talking about, DPP4, that's oxidation. So as things rust, that's how most people can understand the oxidation, that enzyme rusts. And it's because um, you've you've messed up the antioxidant response element um, signaling inside of cells. So glyphosate's turning off the antioxidant system, you get oxidation that DPP-4 then interfaces with another toxin, gluten, so it's not degraded. And then you're turning on a signaling molecule that essentially tells the cell to be independent. So zonulin hits the cells. Um, it tends to, instead of being differentiated, that's the microvilli sticking up, it says, you know, I'm gonna be selfish. I'm gonna pull back my microvilli and, um, disrupt from my neighbors and hunker down and try and try and survive. Um, so at least that's my that's my uh, explanation of how I understand ion ion working in the cell. That, that's great. And I, I always love it when when John goes into cell impersonation mode. <laughs> <laughs> it's always very helpful. Um, and I, I think there's just so many modes. It's like um, this fulvate, this ion is at in service to the human cell and in service to the microbe in, in many different ways. So um, Zach, did you want to, well, Zach, I'm gonna ask you to close close things out. So perhaps um, John wanted you to shed light on your view of what's happening with the ion, but also if you could go right into just any other thoughts after all you've heard today that you might wanna share before we, um, before we let people go. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's uh, John. You're you're so eloquent in the expose on the cell there, and Jeffrey, you as well are so well versed in those cellular patterns. And uh, Kelly, you do such a good job of you know communicating the macro consequences of these cellular events that are unfolding in our, in our food system, and toxicity, and the rest. And so, just deep gratitude for all of you and, and taking us from the micro to the macro and understanding you know, the, the situation we've created as humanity and the path forward is really exciting. Uh, and I think that as we look down at the quantum physics level of what's going on with ion, we get you know, yet another level of beauty uh, that we can show to the world here. And uh, the interesting phenomenon is, about life is that you know we aren't actually made of cells, which is really hard to wrap your head around. We're actually made of atoms and atoms are in you know, these invisible sacred geometry elements that vibrate at these extremely high 
frequencies. And uh, there's this exchange between the electron and the proton at the center of these atoms that leads to a transfer of information down at the atomic level. Uh, the proton seems to have the same geometry as a black hole in the center of our galaxy you know, or any other galaxy. Uh, galaxies, you know, the spiral that comes out of you know, the, the Milky Way or whatnot, those spiraling galaxies are an expression of a black hole. And the black hole is taking light energy, which is a wave form, and then compressing it in this extreme high density of gravity into a particle. And so light can either be wave or particle simultaneously. That's Einstein's work and all that of relativity. But interestingly, once you get to that compression state, the particle tends to dominate the experience of light, and you end up making dust and stardust and ultimately stars. And you, you have this phenomenon of an event horizon. And so the event horizon of a, a galaxy is this disk of stars that shoot out from the center of the black hole as an expression of light energy turned into its particle state or particle expression in the form of suns and planets and moons and all the rest. And it's just an extraordinary thing. It turns out that the black hole uh, in the proton is doing the same thing. It's taking an enormous amount of gravity uh, to compress down light energy in the form of electrons that are in this kind of cloud around the proton and then sending it out in this particle state to express something solid. And that solid thing that we express is a universe of cells. Uh, this cellular kind of universe within us is truly astronomical in its scale. 70 trillion human cells powered by 14 quadrillion mitochondria. Yeah, the numbers are just so vast in a single human being. Kelly, your DNA wraps around Mother Earth. If you were to put every strand of DNA in your body from your 70 trillion cells, and, and you would wrap around the Earth 2 million times. And so the scale of a single individual is truly astronomical. And what we see is this interesting thing called life is based on the relationship of the event horizon, the explosion of energy and particle state coming out of a single proton to express some small element, which might be a hydrogen molecule within a single molecule that would then become you know, a, a particle within a cellular structure. That event horizon gets expressed into biology from you know the solid the kind of non-life form of hydrogen can suddenly animate life in the form of water and so the water is the molecule that translates quantum physics into biology and so what ion is ultimately doing is playing in this space between water structure within our cells the electrical transfer of information at the electron level which then gets pulled on into the proton of every single atom within every single cell, and then it re-expresses life with that new information. And so when you swallow ion, you're literally taking information stream in the form of electrons from soil systems, ancient, 60 million year old, and reintroducing humanity to this ancient soil. The soil hasn't existed in human lifetimes, right? And so we've only been here 200,000 years. We don't know the exposure of intelligence of fossil soil 60 million years old until you take that swallow of ion. And so you're tuning yourself back in time in some ways to an original information stream of how life became abundant on Earth. How does life leap out of nothing? Uh, you know, we, we live in a vacuum space and this little tiny blue marble sitting here floating in the space that we call Earth. How did life occur here? And the answer has to do with this extraordinary dance between light energy, a black hole within the proton, its expression of particle state, and then the phenomenon of water taking that into a living system. And so ion is playing in the space of space, time, water, and ultimately then it's water's impact on cellular structure. And so John mentioned importantly that he has deep understanding of how ion would interface with the, the DNA strand to improve genetic repair and things like that. The DNA strand in its double helix does not exist in that form unless it's coated by water. And so water is coating this nucleotide sequence that we would call human DNA or the DNA of an earthworm or the first microbes, whatever. Water is allowing information to traffic and form the particle state, the expression of life at every level. And so it's a really exquisite dance that we can hardly say we understand. 
but these are brushstrokes of telling you that the miraculous nature of life is so far beyond a bottle of a supplement. What we're doing with ION is not delivering you a supplement, we're delivering you information that says you are rooted in a life state, a state of being alive that has existed since the beginning of the planet. And every eon since its existence, this world has expressed more life, more beauty, more biodiversity, more adaptation, more intelligence. Every eon. And there's five great extinction events that happen over those eons, and we're in the sixth extinction now, and there will be higher levels of intelligence with this next iteration of life. And if we stop doing what we're doing, which is putting ourselves in opposition with nature and undermining her biology, undermining her biodiversity, our farming, our pharmaceutical industry, uh, our transportation industry, our information technology goes on and on and on. We are undermining life. If we change direction and we align ourselves with nature, we will see an explosion of intelligence that we get to participate in. Or we go extinct and it happens without us. But in my narcissistic human version, I'm excited to stay in play. That's amazing. Uh, I think we switched into a physics webinar, but uh, kind of blows my mind a little bit. So thank you for taking on this journey, Zach. It's beautiful and it's amazing. Um, we're just so grateful to all of the panelists for being here. It's been a real honor for me personally um, and to all of you who made it a priority to engage with us today. I think it's been a great discussion and hopefully it's provided some context around the issue of gluten sensitivity. But, but more than that, hopefully it's provided some empowering information that can help us all take ownership over what we put in our bodies, our own health, what we're doing to the planet, all of those things. And I just wanna thank you all for joining us and I hope you have a great uh, rest of the day or evening. Thank you.